Hey, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Hope your season is going well. Talk a little bit about that very soon. Mine as well. Maybe even a lamentation or two. <laughs> we'll see. Great show in store for you today. We got one of the experts, probably the expert on Bob White's and Blue Quail. We'll get some of his tips. We'll understand the birds better so we can become better conservationists and hunters too. Scoot your bird dog up closer to the speaker. He might learn something as well, either from that or for some some of the other things we're going to cover today. Uh, reader poll, your hunting reports, our handle it segment on approaching a pointing dog, maybe even a public access tip or two. All coming to you from the Cabela's Podcast Studio. Thanks for joining me. Well, I don't know how your season is really going. I'm wishful, of course, and uh, positive. I keep visiting places I've never visited before. This one in the same general region as a few other spots I like in Nevada, but covered all new ground uh, three or four days uh, last week and uh, learned a whole heck of a lot about the birds. You know, the chucker hunters in particular, we, we talk all about, well, this time of year, the birds are going to be eating all that greened up cheek grass shoot and things like that. Uh, looking for wa- water is no longer a problem. Well, it is. It still is, as this is recorded. Um, there's still not much in the way of precipitation in most of the West, and it's uh, affecting the birds' movements, their traditional movements, if you will. Learned that the hard way. Finally found chuckers on the only big slope that had a lot of cheek grass growing on it. Now, this time of year, of course, it's not really growing. And as I said, it's not greening up. The new shoots are not coming up. Uh, but there is cheat grass seed everywhere. In fact, I I popped the crop on one of these birds uh, when I brought it home. And it had a golf ball-sized wad of cheat grass seed. Nothing else. In fact, that was its entire diet. So don't believe everything you see hear or read because sometimes mother nature has a way of playing a few games with us and that is one perfect example same trip in fact same slope up towards the top big sheer rock wall and then almost a cave uh for you know about 60 80 yards it was the mother of all chucker roosts there must have been three or four inches of chucker droppings, a five-foot-wide band that was at least 20 feet long. It was, man, we're going to put a, we're going to try to put a game camera up there and see what happens in the afternoon. I know as we were headed down the slope at dark, the birds were headed down the cliff into that hiding place, and um, it would have been interesting to see how many ended up there. It was epic to say the least so anyway hope you're discovering some new country and uh, your dog is doing great and is healthy we'll talk a little bit about that down the road and that you're having a good time it's all about the camaraderie the places we go the dog work oh yeah and a bird here or there speaking of which thank you for all your great hunting reports patrick states says they got into birds in northeast colorado only put one in the bag but that's okay Because Rebel, his German short hair, also got a kangaroo rat. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, I watched Flick do virtually the same thing with a little ground squirrel. Coming down off that slope, in fact. (laughs) Kevin McLaughlin had a pretty good day in Oklahoma. Roosters in the morning and quail in the afternoon. Man, that is what it's all about in Oklahoma. Hope you're taking advantage of that relatively new... uh, a public access program. I think you call it OLAP out there. We were, we christened a few of those places the uh, last time I was out in OK. Tony Arneson says his English setter pup's first Hungarian partridge was brought to bag in Idaho. Great day. She put it all together. Good looking little dog there, Tony, and good luck with both of those dogs and, um, and with, uh, with all the wonders that come with a brand new bird dog. Michael Gill, welcome to the fraternity. Michael went on his first chucker hunt, shot a few birds, and walked many miles. 
He says he definitely needs to work on conditioning his dog's feet. How about your own feet, Michael? Chucker ground is hard on them. Yeah, well, I've talked about that. Maybe I'll do some more talking about that down the road. And as we all say, the first time you hunt them is for fun. And Michael's got it right. After that, it's for revenge. Congratulations. And Greg Patick spent the last week hunting walk-in country in Kansas with new friends, human and canine. There you go. What more can I say? Mark Cross, John Salfisberg, Dan Lenson, and Patrick Gilly, thank you so much. Those are great photos. You know, it doesn't have to be an accounting of your trip over the weekend. It can be a great photo from a, it looks like a selfie taken by Mark Cross's dog to some kind of artful stuff from Dan Lenson that's kind of frosty, etc. So uh, keep it up. Uh, love to see your stuff. So do all the other folks on our Facebook page, Wing Shooting USA Facebook Facebook page, or the Upland Nation Facebook page. Either one, I check them both a couple times a day. All right, so just about ready to talk with Dale Rollins from the Rolling Plains Quail Research Foundation. But before we do, a quick reminder. The Upland Nation podcast is brought to you in part by Sage and Breaker, gun care products crafted at the highest caliber. This time of year, several good things happening at sageandbreaker.com. Last-minute gift ideas of all sorts for you or for somebody else, or just make your significant other aware of that sageandbreaker.com website. New products, free shipping always. Get more information and learn from all their great videos at sageandbreaker.com. And without further ado, let's get to the main topic today, Bob White's and Blues. No, all quail, no, no music in there, except that little music in the background. Uh, Dr. Dale Rollins joins us. Dale is the executive director of the Rolling Plains Quail Research Foundation, a nonprofit that focuses on one thing, understanding and managing Bob White and scaled quail in West Texas. Everything they do, they say, centers around quail and quail hunting. Their, mis their mission is to preserve Texas's heritage of wild quail hunting for this and future generations. Joining me on the line, Dr. Dale Rollins. Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast, Dale. Well, it's good to be with you today. I look forward to it. You know, I, I look at it this way. What's good for Texas quail is probably good for quail in Oklahoma and uh, uh, everywhere else that they dwell. And that's why I thought you would be such a great interview and so helpful to all of us who pursue these little birds here and there and probably get frustrated by them most of the time. You know, you, you've, you've been in this world for a long time. Uh, I'm not going to go through the entire CV with you, but uh, you got a PhD from Texas Tech. You were inducted into the Texas Conservation Hall of Fame. My alma mater, Field and Stream, named you a hero of conservation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whew. Uh, what brought you to quail? Well, I would like to think that uh, it was more work quail brought themselves to me and it wasn't so much uh, it, it's it's what i call destiny you know i often liken my journey in life to that little white feather in forrest gump and i tell people that uh, over my 55 years of hunting quail that that uh, that that little white feather was the was a bob white feather and uh, it's just uh, it's been a great odyssey for me and i've enjoyed every minute of it what what part of it really trips your trigger? I mean, I know what it is for me, but I, you know, I try to be unbiased and let everybody else answer their question in their own way. Um, what what is it about that whole thing that that gets you the most excited? Well, that, I think that changes over a hunter's life. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, until the time I was twenty five, I had a bloodlust and I wanted to. Carry, I carried a Remington eight seventy, which I thought was the most deadly shotgun for hunting quail. And I wanted to get a bag of lemon quail every time I went. Now, 40 years later, um, it's just not that important to me. I, I enjoy being with the dogs and being with my friends. And whether or not we kill 
a single bird or a single limit is kind of um, just not that important to us anymore. We enjoy the opportunities to relive the memories that we've created on all those many quit hunts over the years. Amen to that. And you know, it's funny, it's almost universal. And, and I think most of the time it is chronological. You're absolutely right. Um, and someday I'll do a whole podcast on that topic, but it's, um, it, it is all about the other stuff now, isn't it? Yeah. I tell people that, um, that quail hunting is like, um, it's, it's like MTV. If, if that's, not too old a reference. There's a whole lot of things going on. It's action oriented. You don't have to be quiet. You don't have to be stealthy. You can be uh, poking and prodding at one another and just enjoying all the sights and sounds that make up a good quick Texas quail hunt. Yeah, I love it. That's great. All right. So you started with the classic, um, but let's get the important stuff out of, uh, out of the way real fast. Uh, Dale Rollins, is it an over and under, a side by side, a semi auto, or a pump gun for you these days? It's an over and under these days. I shoot a Ruger twenty eight, a Ruger Red Label twenty eight gauge. I shot that for roughly twenty years now, and really enjoy it. So do I. Uh, <laughs> I love that gun, and I I wish I could use it a little more often. But we need a little. Uh, I need a few more pellets in mine most of the time. H how about the other important question: pointer or flusher? Pointer. You run in dogs? Yes, uh, I have setters, and actually, it's that's not quite a true statement. Because beginning in about 1991, I had my first access. I got my first access to a Lou Ellen setter that I called Susie. And I'm, I'm very quick to tell people I'm not a dog trainer. I like to give a dog plenty of opportunities to express their genetic potential and then hopefully mentor with one of their parents. And so uh, I got Susie when she was seven weeks old. Uh, Never forget the day my brother in law said, Come down in here and look at these bird dog pups. And I was kind of, I'd been out of the bird dog world for about 10 years. And I said, um, I don't have time for a bird dog. And I was kind of creeping into the deer world a little bit. But uh, when Susie struck that pose, she stole my heart. And ever since that time, uh, me and my buddy Steve and a couple of other guys, we have developed, I hate to call it a line, but, um, we breed uh, Britneys and Setters, and it's uh, literally about, typically about 15 sixteenths Brittany. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Uh, about 15 sixteenths uh, Setter. So we call them Betters. And uh, again, we're not, we're not into registered dogs. We're not into field trials. We're into uh, good dogs, and uh, the people that hunt with us will typically ask did you train those bird dogs and again i tell them i'm not a dog trainer but the ability for a bird dog to mentor and uh, be raised with its mother it's a dam if she's a good dog that's the biggest part of bird dog training in my opinion and so uh we've i guess that's been what 20 years or 30 years ago now and so we've still got dogs kind of coming out of that line and uh, they're very, they're very loving dogs. Uh, people and a lot of people in Texas will think that setters just can't hack it. Uh, Texas is too tough. Cactus is too much. Got to be a Roman foot soldier. It's got to be a pointer. Uh, I don't believe that at all. And uh, the, the resurgence in setters out in West Texas uh, has been pleasing to see over the last 15 years. Okay. So I got to ask <laughs> why the one sixteenth Brittany in those dogs? Well, again, I started my prototype better. Her name was little Amy. She was half Brittany, half setter. And her uh, father was a French Brittany. And we liked the way he hunted. We liked the way Susie hunted. Again, we said, what the heck? And the Brittany is a great natural retriever. And so mm -hmm. they didn't take a whole lot of that in there to really make a difference. And then the uh, setter, you just got the, the flag. And uh, there's nothing more beautiful in uh, West Texas in the fall. 
and a stand of broom wheat that's about 18 or 20 inches tall and you see that uh, you see that flag coming up above that dense stand of broom weed that's just what i call up periscope oh i love that yeah that's so so true it is now are, if you've been doing this for a while are you throwing any tri-colored betters or are they all coming out uh, mainly setter colors they're all they're all setter colors, orange and white, typically. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess the odds are with that kind of a proportion that's <laughs> going to happen. That's for sure. Um, so let's start our talk about Bob Whites, and we'll get into blue quail down the road because I want I want to figure out how to actually shoot a few someday. But first, tell us all about Rolling Plains and uh, and kind of give us the the, the four one one on on the organization and and some of your activities well back in about 2004 uh well actually back in 1993 i developed a youth program called the bob white brigade and we use quail as a tool to teach leadership development and so they spend five days learning all about quail and, and bird dogs and shotguns and all those things to create and instill confidence in them as young leaders and about um, 2003, we had a, a bead on some philanthropists uh, up in Pennsylvania, the Richard King Mellon Foundation. And we had an opportunity to get one of their board members down here and show him what we were doing. They liked the program that they were doing. They've adopted a similar program up in uh, Pennsylvania now. But we also invited two of them down for three years of quail hunting and this would have been about like oh three four five and those were pretty good years for quail and so uh we wanted to grease the skids if you will and and we did we showed them uh, three successive days of 30 to 35 plus cutty outings and uh when i met them uh the uh the Mellon Foundation is a big player in the conservation fund down in Florida, uh, mostly of what you might recognize as tall timbers and some of those plantations. And so I first met them, and, and I wasn't flippant when I said, what you guys need is a ranch from West Texas, and let me manage it for quail for you. Well, about uh, six months later, after the season was over, um, they came to one of the guys that was helping me pull this together and said, we'd like to we'd like to uh, purchase a ranch and let y'all manage it for quail in West Texas. So uh, that kind of planted the seed. And here in about six months then, uh, we located a 4,700 acre property that uh, was subsequently purchased by the conservation fund. And then a year later, it was deeded over to the Rolling Plains Quail Research Foundation, which is a 501c3. And that's, uh, that was in 2006. And so for about the last 14 years now, uh, again, we use that 4,700-acre area to do everything that we can learn about quail. We say that everything at the research ranch points to quail. They're at the apex of everything we do. So if it's sky burn, if it's prickly pear control, if it's uh, planting some type of seed or whatever, uh, everything moves in that direction. And it's also used as an educational laboratory. So we've got uh, field days and uh, extension type activities going on all the time and having people out there to, to demonstrate what the proper landscape for Bob White Quail in West Texas should look like and how to, how to get it there. Are there any particular initiatives or research projects that we should know about that, uh, that could affect us down the road that you're working on? Yeah. Uh, one, our biggest research initiative to date started back in 2010, and I have a committee. I have a uh, advisory committee that meets once a year. And in 2009, I said um, I always ask them for what what they think their uh, upcoming forecast is. Do you think it's going to be a six? Do you think it's going to be an eight? Do you think it's going to be a two? And one of the uh, gentlemen that was uh, always very uh, spot on with his forecast he told me his name is roy wilson he said dale i don't know he said i've got to where i cannot make a call it used to be that we could say what we had out there in january i'm sorry in july and august and extrapolate that two months 
and we'd have a pretty good quail season. But then it just became a, a situation where, again, we didn't feel like we could make a, an educated guess on it. And so we brought together colleagues of mine from uh, four or five different universities. And our board of directors said, Rollins, you've been saying disease is something that really intrigues you. Get to the bottom of it. Here's the money. We'll burn the furniture if we need to. And uh, but let's go whole hog into this disease effort, and uh, so that's became known as Operation Idiopathic Decline. Idiopathic being medical jargon for the doctor don't know, and so a lot of people think there's some kind of disease that comes through about September. Uh, they'll blame the dove hunters, but then all of a sudden they won't be seeing quail. So what you know what happens kind of thing, and so we did the old. College Drive folding together uh, studies uh, across 35 counties in West Texas and Western Oklahoma. We um, we involved, um, like I said, about uh, nine different scientists, and we collected about 2,200 quail. Uh, when I said collect, we trapped them and took blood and uh, liver samples and all kinds of uh, state-of-the-art uh, disease testing kind of thing. The biggest thing that came out of that was the dominance of two parasites. First one is called the cecal worm. It uh, occurs down in the lower gut. And the other one is called the eye worm. And it occurs in and around the eye. Now, neither one of those were unknown. They were The, the eye worm has been the one that has continued to capture most of the attention since that time. And those have been known since at least 1959. But what we don't know is what happened between 59 and 2019. Uh, were, there, were there years when the eye worms were really, really bad and others that they're not? So we've continued to monitor that situation and with the goal of developing an FDA approved feed for wild birds. And it'll be the only the second wild bird feed ever, ever approved by the FDA. And uh, we're very close to that. We think we'll have it ready within the next year. It's got to, again, it's got to go through all the chemical auspices and testing and so forth of the and scrutiny of the FDA. I'm sure the FDA has been busy with the uh, COVID right now, but uh, we're getting closer. And we think uh, if it works as we think it will, we think that this might be one of the uh the the real uh real game changers that could be out there so wow anxious for that um then our, our, our other big effort that we've been doing for the last five or six years is the translocation of wild trapped quail to points further east uh if you know anything about bob whites once you get about i-35 all the way to uh, Tallahassee, Georgia, you don't have very many. Now you get down there in the Red Hills region, tall timbers, and uh, they've cracked the code down there. They can they can uh, raise uh, wild bob whites and they can do a good job. It's just expensive to do it because of uh, what the expenses for management are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So those have been our two biggest efforts right now. We do a lot of other things. We do a lot of radio telemetry work. We would focus in a lot on uh, on uh, predator management, some of the topics that are kind of taboo in uh, today's world, but uh, we focus quite a bit on pred predation management and being able to uh, document what the worst enemies of quail are and then try to use habitat management to mitigate the impacts of those to where we can uh, Except, you know, we got we got to live with predators. I mean, that's that's just a political reality. But how can we do our best to shift the competitive competitive advantage away from the predator and in the favor of the quail? You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. That's Dr. Dale Rollins. He's the executive director at the Rolling Plains Quail Research Foundation. They're over there in Texas, doing a great job, learning the stuff that will ultimately help us all in one way or another. Dale, I got to ask, so th this feed you're talking about is, in effect, it's a 
I'll call it a vaccine for the eye worm. Is that an adequate description for it? It'll be a medicated feed uh, with a anthelmintic in it, which uh, when the birds ingest it, it'll kill both the eye worm and the sequel worm. And then uh, where we've got to see is what kind of a efficacy and what kind of a response do we see after administering that to birds in the wild. So we've still got a, a couple of hurdles to jump on that. And we've been we've been working on this for about nine years. It's wow. been a long, complex uh, uh, road to hoe, so to speak. But we're making progress, and we're optimistic, cautiously optimistic again that it's going to be a game changer. Well, good luck on that, and we'll keep our fingers crossed for sure. Let's get down to brass tacks on some of the stuff that's important to uh, we as conservationists and hunters, uh, as opposed to you serious biologist types. Um, what kind of what what if you had to describe perfect bob white quail habitat what are the elements well first let me say that most of my career i was an extension wildlife specialist an outreach specialist for texas a m university and so i i traveled all across west texas south texas giving programs to landowners saying you know if you want your quail habitat to promote more quail, these are the things you need to think about. And probably the most popular tool that came out of that is what I call the softball habitat evaluation technique. Shit, be careful with the pronunciation. <laughs> and, and what this is, everybody's played slow pitch softball. Now, if I tell a cowboy or a rancher in West Texas, that I'd like to have uh, 50 square feet of woody cover every 100, 125 feet, and I'd like to have uh, grass about uh, 18 inches tall, but I'd like to have interspersion of brush and grass. Some of that's just going to be glossing over. It's uh, it's not a complex um, puzzle, but it'll, it'll gloss over. But if I talk to them about softball, and I say, okay, how many people are have tried to play slow-pitch softball? Everybody has. And then I'll say, how many players are on a softball team, defensive players? They'll first say nine, but I'll correct them. I'll say, no, 10. There's a rover out there. So I want you to visualize. I want, to vi I want you to visualize that landscape to where you see that, that softball complex. And everywhere that there's a defensive player, I want there to be some kind of shrub. Now, these are what generically I call quail houses. And it would be something like a plum thicket. Uh, it could be a little leaf sumac. Uh, it, a lot of different brush species can fill that uh, component. But you've got that out there. So that gives you the visual idea of what it should look like. And then I tell them, okay, now you're the pitcher. And you're, you're the pitcher and you're holding that softball. Well, that softball is a quail. It's about the same size as a quail. And it has about the same dilemmas as a quail because every time it's exposed, somebody's trying to whack it or uh, eat it. And the quail has the same dilemmas kind of thing. So uh, we talk about that and uh, that a quail should not, if you were to toss a softball 46 feet pitching distance, and if you can still see the quail or see the softball at that point, you've got insufficient grass cover. So that's one of our biggest issues in West Texas is our stocking rates often get too high and we, we endure a drought in low cattle markets. And so therefore our country just gets overgrazed more often than it needs to. And so by doing that and by giving the landowners something that they can appreciate and palpate like that, uh, it's really helped them to appreciate what good quail habitat should look like. And I actually, I tell people it's uh, cowboy approved because I, <laughs> After a field day one time, this cowboy walked up to me. He said, until you told us about that softball technique, he said, I didn't really understand what the boss man was looking for. I know what kind of habitat he's looking for because he was an absentee landowner but running cattle. So, therefore, he was uh, more appreciative of what the boss was really wanting. Well, you were a teacher as well as I was, and I remember the teacher who taught me how to teach said, take them from where they are to where you want them to be. Yeah, And, and that's it. what, what you're doing. Dale Rollins, um, we're just getting warmed up around here, and I'm 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 a, a kind of kind of astounded at how similar 
your description just now is for so many other game birds out there, there, re- there really are some fundamental elements to that habitat. And I was living it again over the weekend uh, in Chucker in Qu- uh, Valley Quail country. And the overgrazing again seemed to be one of the bigger issues. And granted, Texas has more public land, I mean, private land than, than where I usually hunt. But uh, can you do anything on the, you know, on the private land besides beg and plead with these guys to manage it better? Absolutely. Uh, the the uh, ethics of land ownership and of wildlife, those are very important to most Texas landowners. Uh-huh. I'll often tell ranchers that a quail's best friend is a, is a, a rancher with bird dog because if they've got a bird dog then they're evaluating their daily management decisions as it relates to both their vocation and their avocation now if they don't have interest in a bird dog they're just seeing it on one side there and that grass is just more grass i'm consuming with my cattle more profit i can make but if they're involved and interested in quail they understand that 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 there are some uh, trade-offs there and if they won't have quail there, they've got to adjust those, adjust and address those trade-offs. Stay with me, Dale Rollins, with the, pardon me, now you've got me doing it, Rolling Plains <laughs> Quail Research Foundation. Got a, a moment or two of break here. And the rest of you stick around. We're just getting warmed up on the strategic side of quail hunting. And we have another species to talk about as well. It's all coming up real soon right here on the Upland Nation podcast. First, a message or two from our sponsors, including Dr. Tim's Performance Dog Food. Learn more at drtims.com. Soon you'll be seeing a video I did that kind of lays out uh, the Dr. Tim's philosophy of what's important in a dog food. Well, I can tell you from personal experience, yet again, Flick is on the program and he is doing a great job this time of year he's doing anywhere from 15 to 30 miles a day when we hunt chuckers and quail out there in the west and he is doing very well because he has a strong foundation built on dr tim's dog food he calls it performance dog food for a reason dogs perform this time of year is when the rubber meets the road one aspect of that is the fat in a performance dog food that is where most of the Short-term energy comes from. Short-term being you eat it, you get energy that day, the next day. Chicken fat is the most easily metabolized fat, and it also has natural preservatives. No need for all those rasty chemicals and some of the other dog foods out there when you're doing it right with chicken fat. That's what Dr. Tim uses. Quick reminder, 30% discount on your first order. Use the code UplandNation. Tell them I sent you at D-R-T-I-M-S dot com. And if you're telling him I sent you at Dr. Tim's, it's because you heard this message and you probably are protecting your hearing. Hopefully with ESP, Electronic Shooters Protection, Electronic Earplugs. You can learn more at ESPAmerica.com. Yeah, I'll tell you more about that hunt real soon because it was spectacular. But I heard those birds flying away at 200 yards because I was wearing my ESP electronic earplugs. And I did hear a couple bad jokes about my shooting, but they were way down at the bottom of the hill while I was up at the top. Yeah, I will hold that against you on our next trip, Dave. 30-day money-back trial at ESPAmerica.com. Get fitted locally. In the privacy of your local audiologist's office, it comes with the project. No extra charge for that. Just go to the dealer locator page, ESPAmerica.com, and type in your address. All right, speaking of that hunting trip, I know I brought I brag on Flick a lot, um, and here's another chance to do it in our Handle It segment from the Cabela's Podcast Studio. We finally got to the top and literally climbed over a little cliff that had a few broken spots. And on the top was where we actually ultimately found the chuckers. Not very many, but there were some out there and they were doing a good job of staying away from us. 
until I turned to talk to my buddy and I said, hey, what's, hey, that's Flick on Point. Luckily, we had about 320 yards to discuss our strategy once we got there because they were a long way off and knock wood, Flick was holding that point very well. And I remembered that if we want those birds to fly in a direction where we could actually shoot at them, let's flank that dog, one go right, one go left, approach from away from the dog, and if possible, even circle kind of inward and kind of perform a pincher movement on the birds so that they're between us and the dog. Sure enough, it worked. Not well enough. We drew feathers on one bird, went over the cliff. We spent another hour looking for that bird. I don't think it ever slowed down. Well, it was fun anyway. Flick, good job. Thank you all for listening. If you'd like more tips like that, they're all over the findbirdhuntingspots.com web pages. Enjoy the tips and offer up a few of your own. Dr. Dale Rollins with the Rolling Plains Quail Research Foundation. Uh, welcome back to the podcast. Good to be back. Well, um, we got started on this stuff, and as a 55 years of experience quail hunter, you probably have some suggestions about how to do this stuff. Um, let's start with quail habitat. You know, everybody I talk to, and we discuss this every time I'm out in the field, you know, if only somebody would tell me at 9 o'clock they are going to be here, and at 11 o'clock they're going to be here, and at 14 o'clock they're going to be here, are there any reliable habits that a quail will have during the hunting season? Well, yes. No, they won't necessarily be absolute because they will change daily on the weather systems and so forth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In general, they're going to break roost around 7 o'clock in the morning. They'll probably, if it's cold, they're going to kind of stay covered up there probably until uh, 7.30, 7.45, and then they'll, begin to wander off and begin to feed at that point in time. And uh, typically that feeding, again, if it's cold, that, that feeding is going to only pick up in uh, duration during the day. If it's a warm day and their food needs are not that high, that's the toughest time to pattern quail. Mm -hmm. But cold day, uh, and probably the very best time to go is like 5 o'clock in the afternoon because sometimes quail won't feed in the morning. But sure. rarely do you ever see them miss an evening meal. And so the more active they are searching, uh, the more sense your, your dogs will be finding. And so typically, I like to think that if I see six cubbies in the morning, I'm expecting to see 12 in the afternoon. I expect my afternoon hunt to double whatever my morning hunt was. Wow. Well, you, you know, you got, you got access to the good stuff. Some of us are grateful for 12 coveys in a season, but that's another story. Uh, you know, again, I live on the desert. Most of the birds I hunt are desert birds. Uh, any, uh, any truth of the rumor that Bob whites need what I'll call live water every day? No, 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 they need water. All animals need water, but they quail will get most of the water they need from uh, the dew that's on plants, from the uh, metabolic water that they get when they're ingesting greens or ingesting insects. And then they will use free water, water from a trough, water from a stream or whatever, but they don't have to have it if those other sources of water are there. So uh, water is, is something that's, and again, as you move west and you get into Gamble's country and so forth, that in blue quail country, that water is going to be more important to you because it's a more xeric habitat kind of thing. Yeah. But even in like a, it's very dry in West Texas right now, and I was looking at some crop contents from a colleague of mine that sent me last night, and there's a little uh, spindly cactus across much of West Texas called Tasahia, jumping cactus or pencil cactus, and it has little red fruits on it. And uh, if you're looking for a place to find blue quail in West Texas this year, you you look out for the uh, you look out for the uh, Tasahia stands that you can find. And in this particular one last night, they'll have the little red berries, but this one didn't have red berries, but it had 15 or 20 tips of those uh, stem segments. And so you'd think, well, what in the world would quail be getting out of those? 
well, they're getting moisture out of it. Yeah. Probably not yeah. to it, but uh, they're getting, they're using it for, for food moisture. I'm sorry, using it for moisture. Funny thing, uh, yeah, out, <coughs> out here in the West, we, we find the same, I'll bet a, a berry that could be confused with the tassahia that, that, that is actually a rose hip kind of a thing. And, and they'll get into that. The, the valleys will do that all the time. I remember hunting a, a draw once, uh, several times one year where there was one valley quail under every wild rose bush. I don't know if they'd sent the memo out or it was just mere coincidence, but it happened more than once. Um, be, beyond, uh, Beyond those food sources, are there any in particular that we could be looking for, generally speaking, uh, as a, a matter of course during hunting season? Well, first of all, you're looking for really any kind of a weedy forb, as we'd call them, just, yeah. you know, a broadleaf weed that's producing seed, whether that be a pigweed seed or a doveweed seed. Anything that's producing a seed like that, quail are going to probably be eating it. So as you shoot a couple of birds, the, one of the first things I ever do is I get a bird in the hand as I pop that crop content open and spread those contents out. And I've studied quail a long time, so I know what most of those seeds are. And that's my backdoor botany, you know. So if I see something that's got a lot of wolfberry fruits in it, well, then I know I want to be looking on the landscape for where the wolfberry is occurring because that's one of the key uh, focal areas for for quail right now again especially you know you, we're in a tough year we've been in three tough years out here so the tougher the situation gets the fewer the quail we had to find so the, the smarter you got to be to uh, begin to identify what those plants that they deem important and be able to uh hone in on those as you're looking for the birds and you know you know you bring that up uh, and you know these you know what the seeds to some of those plants look like but i'm going to give you a great example of how we need to dig just a little deeper as hunters uh to help ourselves in that regard i was hunting valley quail along a, a certain river i can't name because it was somebody else's but uh, um i kept finding these little very dark colored, fairly good sized seeds in these quail crops. And, and I couldn't figure out what the heck it was until I was walking through a stand of what we call um, Canada thistle. And they all have kind of a bulbous kind of a top to them. And if, if you brush against them and you can't help but not when they're as thick as they are out there, you'd hear them rattle just like a maraca. So I cracked one of those open and sure enough, that's where the seeds were. So these birds are either finding those on the ground or they're knocking them down or they're tearing apart those little bulbs, whatever it is. So, you know, it probably makes good sense, even if we're not a Ph.D., to open up some of these plants and see what the innards look like. Would that would that be worthwhile for most of us? Well, I always recommend that all hunters become what I call students of quail. And a student of quail doesn't mean you're after a, a master's degree in it. Just means that you have a penchant for learning more about that bird, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and being able to synthesize what that story is. And that's by uh, by reading the landscape, learning to read the landscape. And you're going to learn to read the landscape by the knowledge of those plants. And so I always encourage people to learn a plant a week. I say, take off, uh, learn a plant a week, and I'll give you two weeks off at Christmas. If you know 50 plants at the end of the year, you'll be the most bot botanically literate person that you hunt with. I love it. We had, we made a joke to each other just uh, just on Sunday on our last hunt. I said, you know, we're kind of, <laughs> we're kind of like Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. We're, ostensibly, we're hunting, but we're poking around and digging in the dirt and finding stuff and bringing it home and whatever like it or not there's always something in the vest that they don't they don't really care to see but they're going to see it anyway because we found it um can can we can we shoot out a covey or is that just a myth from the old days what, what are the what are the biggest population impacts on a covey of quail all right you can shoot out a covey uh, and one of the things as quail numbers go down historically hunting would have been self-limiting in other words mm -hmm. if it was a four year like it is this year i might say well dallas cowboys ain't very good but i believe i'll stay home this sunday and watch them as opposed to chasing blues but if it's uh if, if there's a lot of quail then it's it's comp compensatory and uh it's really not that big a deal 
But with today, at least in Texas again, at least in Texas, the value of quail hunting, and especially to people out of state, and this is unpalatable perhaps to most of your listeners because uh, if you're going to hunt in Texas, you're probably going to have to be paying somebody for access to get on there. And so if you've got if you've got quail hunting that is free, all of a sudden if it gets pretty pretty poor, you're probably not coming back. But if you've paid two thousand dollars for a quail lease, and your wife says, "Well, my golly, you spent that money. Don't you think you need to be out there hunting quail?" The the self-regulatory nature of quail hunting is not the same when we've got a uh, a very valuable game bird, and you've probably been out around uh, Patagonia, Arizona, some of that. You, you know, you know how much how much hunter traffic there is out there, even in a bad year. So there's uh, it, it can be negative. It's not always neutral. Yeah, there is that attitude that I paid for a limit. I'm going to get a limit no matter what. Um, are there um, are there other things that have a major effect on quail uh let's say during the off season uh, predators what number one uh in which are the biggest but uh weather and things like that are they actually are there other uh population impacts that w- that will help us understand quail conservation well in the southwest weather is the number one factor mm-hmm. and again when you're going through three years like we've come come through and low cattle prices and I mean, I've been across New Mexico all the way up to uh, Wyoming, and that country looks as hard as I've ever seen it right now because of low cattle prices and dry weather. So uh, that's that's a big, big thing. And uh, the uh, the ability to use cattle as a tool is uh, very attractive, but it's got to be used as a tool and not just have cows and quail at the same time. And it can be done like that, but if you've got one guy with an interest in the cows and another guy with an interest in the quail, again, you've probably got a recipe for headaches there. Um, as far as uh, predation and so forth, <coughs> the quail's every living, breathing moment is dictated by the threat of predation. Now, it doesn't mean we go out and nuke all the predators. What it says we've got to think about every day what is the quail hiding from today? How are they going to cope with the fact that uh, bobcats are, are uh, let's, let's use, uh, let's use uh, Cooper's hawks, aceptor hawks, which will be migrating down this way in uh, October. And boy, that becomes a rough neighborhood when them and the northern harriers get here because they're two very uh, astute predators on the bobcat and blue quail. Don't get me started. I just hope they migrate real soon because I'm sick and tired of them standing outside my my pigeon coop waiting for me to open the door. Does rain make quail if it's at the right time of the year? I would say yes. I mean, without rain at the right time of year, you're not going to be ready, being able to raise your quail because I want you to think of a quail. I often have a group of landowners and I'll have them each one holding a cube of ice in their hands and I'll say all right that's your quail population study it for one minute and tell me what's happening and after one minute I'll say all right what's happening to your population they said it's melting well that's what quail do they melt and if we don't get new ice in ever so often we're in a world of hurt really soon so uh, we've got to have the we've got to have the ice you know in the form of not ice but we've got to have rain uh, which in our analogy here is uh, providing ice cubes and so forth um the other thing is and i want to go back to the predation standpoint just a little bit there are two major threats Uh, you've got your meso carnivores these are the everything from a coyote down to a badger raccoon that kind of thing and then you've got the uh, raptors. Now the raptors, in our studies, over the last 12 years, the raptors have accounted for about, typically about 30% of our winter mortality, and then maybe only uh, 15% of our summer mortality. Our, our, our mammalian predators 
a much more important place during the summer. And there are much more, there are much worse uh, nest predators. And I always take a nest predator more seriously than I do one that takes one bird at a time because when they take out a, a clutch of 14 eggs, that gets me upset. So there's uh, a lot that you can do. And, and Scott, I've got a lot of, uh, uh, if we reference our website, uh, quailresearch.org, we've got a whole lot of webisodes, probably 35 different little YouTube webisodes on all the topics that we're going to cover today. You can uh, dial into those. Uh, we have a, uh, we have our own podcast series too. So uh, we'll be talking about, you know, brush control and quail and uh, how, you, how it can work for you or how it can work against you. And then we have a monthly e-quail newsletter that I write every month. So, you know, all of those are free. And you can sit in your recliner and watch them in your comfort of your uh, Bermuda shorts and with a cup of coffee. All of that at quailresearch.org. Org. That is the um, website for the Rolling Plains Quail Research Foundation. You also have a pretty active web, I mean, uh, Facebook page that's looking good. And you're, you're sure enlightening me today. Dr. Dale Rollins with the Rolling Plains Quail Research Foundation. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. If we could do one thing as hunters, Dale, to uh, help the cause, um, what would that be? Well, it would be uh, support, collaborate, engender the support of the landowners. And uh, that takes several forms. One is if it's on public land, you know, you're, you know, we've all seen public land's been trashed out. Uh, so be a good example from that standpoint. If it's on private land, uh, it's probably going to be taken care of because again, you're paying a lease fee for that. And, uh, that there's a lease, there's a clause in there. that tells you, you got to keep that thing cleaned up. But then also, I think, like I said, the best friend a quail has is a cowboy with bird dogs. And if we had more cowboys, more ranchers were uh, using bird dogs or having been exposed to quail. That's something that, in my opinion, we've missed the boat on. And as a result, they're into, they're into team roping and uh, tie-down calf roping and those kinds of things, but they don't have any interest in quail. Well, quail are not going to be very high on their list of uh, interest. And it goes even further than that in that many of our state game biologists are not quail hunters. Mm -hmm. In Texas, they hunt elk, they hunt deer, they hunt waterfowl. But very few of them have bird dogs. I can tell you about five parks and wildlife biologists in the state of Texas that have bird dogs. And that's a shame to me because if we want to get more passion built into those younger biologists, we've got to get them opportunities to, uh, again, get a bird dog and enjoy the finer points of quail hunting with bird dogs. I can't agree more. I'm thinking of some spots I hunted last season, actually, and even once this season, that I was taken to by my my newer buckaroo friend down there in southeast Oregon. Thank you, David, for all of that. And he's one of those guys. He's kind of the poster boy for the example you just made. He, uh, he runs cows down in that country and uh, decided a bird dog was a good idea about four or five years ago. And poof, all of a sudden, we got a guy who looks out for both his cows and his quail and his chucker, too, luckily. Uh, and then he shares them with me. Let's, uh, let's switch, switch gears here, Dr. Dale Rollins. Um, you, um, you know blue, blue quail pretty well. Also, and you know, we call them blue quail, quail, we call them cotton tops, we call them scalies. Well, tell us a little bit about how they differ from bob whites. Well, physically, they're about uh, they're about a half ounce heavier than bob whites are. Uh, you will find bob whites and blue quail running in the same covey. You will find them occupying the same range. That's what we call sympatric when their ranges overlap like that. They will eat about the same diet. Uh, I did my master's degree back in 1980 on bobwhite and blue quail in southwestern Oklahoma. 
and was measuring, you know, what kind of foods do they eat? Did they eat similar foods? And, and yes, they do. They eat just about the same things. A blue quail will nearly always have three to five times more seeds in its crop than what a bob white does. They are a better hustler. Uh, Val Lehman, who was a biologist for the King Ranch many years ago, uh, once said that blue quail are somewhat more intelligent than bob whites. And I think most people that have hunted them would agree. Um, they're, a, they're a great complement to bob white. I always like to think of them as drought insurance because uh, they don't boom quite as well in the good years as what the blues did. I'm sorry, the Bob Whites, but then they don't bust quite as badly in the poor years as the Bob Whites did. So they make a nice uh, little bit of drought insurance, if you will. They're a, they're a truly a trophy quail. I say that every quail is a trophy, but sometimes, uh, for example, uh, a, a Montezuma quail or a uh, uh, Cubby of Blues, uh, those are just, they're trophy quail, and it, because it requires different techniques, and you begin to appreciate them for what they are, you appreciate them for how they scrabble out a living in some really hard country, and uh, so you've got to have an appreciation for that, and then uh, it's just another one of those, you know, it's just another petal in the flower, uh, of the quail flower out there that you'd like to be able to say, uh, I'm I have not hunted all six species of quail. I've hunted four, and the other two are still on my bucket list. But uh, just being able to enjoy the diversity and the different kinds of country that, that you hunt them in, uh, like I said, it's it's like technicolor when you're hunting. I want to ask what's on your bucket list, and I'm telling me telling you that now so that I remember to ask that again. Because the first thing I want to know is you mentioned water and you mentioned smarts when it comes to blues. Um, Every time I've shot a blue quail, it's been within 100 yards of a stock tank. I won't go into all the other strategies we use because I'm going to ask you about that in a minute. But they're, they're not there all the time, are they? Well, they're, they're, they're attracted to two things, and the water's part of it. If you think about a windmill or a water trough that you've come across in New Mexico or wherever, uh, that's being grazed by livestock, the concentration of those grazing animals around those watering points creates a different complement of uh, plants, things like uh, cowpen daisy. And so the, uh, the heavier uh, stocking use and so forth and the soil disturbance of those hooves, uh, that's basically the same as if we were pulling a tandem disc by black country and we're stimulating the types of seeds that quail will be a, uh, the plants that are producing seeds that, that quail are find attractive okay good all right i'm glad to hear that the, the the other thing about my blue quail hunting has always been it's it's almost a run and gun situation we've tried to try to put dogs on the ground and do that you know the traditional way and it must work some places but most of the time it's all it's not the same but it's almost road hunting you're driving from somewhere to somewhere you're piling out and then you're running with an open unloaded gun as far as you can before you get to the birds is that kind of the standard blue quail hunting technique ah uh, that's that's pretty common in Texas. It's kind of the Roman chariot race. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, that's pretty common. Now, I tell you, oh, especially over the last three or four years, we've uh, hunted more and more blue quail because our bob white numbers have been down, and we're hunting more and more blue quail in a non traditional way. We're hunting them with bird dogs. And I would say two years ago, we had as good a season for hunting blue quail behind bird dogs and having points. Because if we saw if we saw perhaps 15 coveys that day, we might have had points on eight of them. And that's pretty impressive for blue quail because, as you know, most of the time they're running, uh, flushing wild and that kind of thing. There's a technique that my buddy Steve, he's the guy that has the better bird dogs with me, and we call it the Steve Sherrod back asward attempt to hunt in blue quail. So typically when you're chasing blue quail, you're following them into the wind. You're hunting upwind and you rarely ever catch up with them. 
because by the time you get up at the dog's point, by the time you get there, they're flushing wild. So what we've learned to do sometimes is just turn around and hunt them downwind. And your dogs will be out there 150, 200 yards ahead of you. And they're going to run by those blue quail. And then they're going to basically turn around and, and horn them in between the dogs and you. I think you heard it. I think I heard you refer to it as a pincher movement a while ago. Yeah. Uh, that works pretty well. Uh, if there are quail out there, you can uh, get them separated. You know, I mean, sometimes with blue quail, you'll have coveys of 60 to 80 birds. And until you can get those coveys down into more manageable units, 5 to 15, they're going to run you to death. So uh, even if your dogs scatter them some and then you begin to hunt back into the the uh, wind down there, where, you know, going back to your, your camp or whatever, that's a pretty productive way to hunt blue quail. I love it. Uh, we usually do that only because we want to get back for happy hour, and that means walking downwind instead of upwind. But I've seen that work in the past. In fact, at least once last weekend I saw that work, and it paid off too. So good boy, Flicky. He's in the back of the room here just uh, just hanging on my every word, as you might be able to tell. Um, all right, so you said uh, four of the six, the other two are on my bucket list. What are those two bucket list quail for you, Dr. Dale Rollins? Those will be the mountain quail and the California quail. Come on down. I'll put you in both any time. Yeah. In fact, there are times when I'll jump a covey that has both. Uh, if we ever if we ever recreate what we had in 2014 through 17, mm-hmm. look me up, Scott. Oh, yeah. were, I've hunted quail for 55 years, uh, really prior to about 1986. I didn't know there was ever such thing as a poor quail year. Some might be better than others. But beginning in 2015-16, uh, we, re- we were routinely pointing 40 to 70 coveys of bob whites and blue quail. And again, maybe a third of them being blues and and uh, two thirds of them being Bob Watts. That was just the, I tell people I've uh, climbed the mountain and I have seen the other side and I want to go back. Yeah. Well, I, I understand that. I can only visualize that in my mind. Like I said, sometimes that's several seasons worth of uh, covey rises for a guy out here in the West, but, um, but I sure would love to see a little bit more of that happening. You know, um, we've talked a lot about quail and uh, a little bit about dogs, but you've been around dogs of various sorts for quite a while here. If you were to uh, leave us with one more bit of advice about hunting quail with dogs, uh, what would it be? Trust your dogs. Yeah. Trust your dogs. Um, I tell you, my dogs typically... I said my betters typically uh, would run maybe 200 yards ahead of me and back and forth across the landscape. You know, again, just one of the beautiful poetry and motion kind of things that sitters do for you. Dale Rollins, you've been hunting quail with bird dogs for 55 years. If you were to leave us with one bit of advice about how to use your dog, how to uh, work with your dog better, what would that advice be? Well, this this uh, better that I had named Susie. That uh, since then I'm I'm philo- I'm kind of a philosopher from time to time, and I wrote a a uh, little ditty called Susie's Twelve Point Plan for Success, and based on life lessons that I've learned with Susie at my side. And the first one is that you always hunt with good dogs. And I mean, you always spend time with your dogs. They, they are your best friends. You always spend time with your best friends that are smarter and faster than you. And you're going to be better off just by associating with those people. So always hunt with good dogs. And then being able to uh, get those dogs out as much as you can. I mean, reps make the dog. And again, it's it's been a tough year for us here in West Texas. But if uh, people will ask me, they say, how many, how many flushes did it take? How many points did it take to uh, get a dog like you've got there? And I'll think about it just a second, and I'll say, oh, about 100. And if you can get that in the first two weeks, that's all the better. 
So just giving them the opportunity to uh, get those reps in and learn because a bird, you know, a bird dog, you're just watching them and you just, you just revel in how much they learn and how much they can teach you if you're willing to be taught. There you go. Uh, tell your spouse you just need to get that dog out more often on more birds, more bird contacts. The doctor's orders. Dr. Right. Dale Rollins, I, I sure had a hell of a good time with you. I sure appreciate your spending some time with us. If you want to learn more about what Dale and everybody on the team is doing out there at the Rolling Plains Quail Research Foundation, go to Quail research.org or just look them up on the Facebook pages and uh, and learn all about what they're doing in the world of conservation based around quail. Nice to see the bird at the top of the pyramid. Love that philosophy. Uh, the rest of you are going to stick around. I've still got this land is your land. Among other things, we're going to talk all about public access and a few other things as well. So stick around. But Dr. Dale Rollins, it's a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for being a part of the Upland Nation podcast. Yes, thank you, Scott. Just a quick reminder that uh, the newsletter poll, the Upland Nation Insights newsletter poll, is sponsored by Happy Jack Dog Care Remedies, Skin, Coat, Parasites, Fleas and Ticks. They've got a remedy for every one of those, among others, including Flix pads, which I'm pretty darn proud of. I shouldn't even talk about it. Learn more at happyjackinc.com. That's happyjackinc.com. Yeah, talking about the newsletter. If you haven't gotten it, sign up at findbirdhuntingspots.com. Every week, in addition to all the other good stuff, hopefully, that you can use over the weekend, uh, I ask a question and I get your answers, and quite often they are very enlightening, including this one. And this is probably a weird year to ask this, but I'm still very encouraged. The question was, do you hunt outside your own state most seasons? And, you know, granted, it's been different this year for everybody in so many ways, but still 48% of you said, yes, I'm hunting out of state sometime in the season. Uh, 51 and a half or so percent said, nope, stick closer to home. Uh, and I understand all of those rationales. So good to learn, good to know. All right, This Land is Your Land is coming up after this message from Gunner Kennels. Well, they're not even Gunner Kennels anymore. I guess that's a good way to put it. Gunner.com. The reason is they got so many other things these days from accessories for your kennel to gunner gear, hoodies, hats, t-shirts, and gift cards. If you're still searching for that ultimate gift for your hunting buddy or yourself, you can get one at gunner.com. While you're there, watch some of the videos. Look at the extensive testing they do. That's why they build such great products. Take the Fit Finder quiz and even crowdsource your new gunner dog crate. It's all at gunner.com. This land is your land. Brought to you by FindBirdHuntingSpots.com. New material every week to help you find places to hunt, train, and care for your dog. Most of them public access. Well, the dogs aren't public access. You know what I mean. Though. Yeah. One of the places I love, not only because there's some great pheasant hunting, but because the people are unbelievably nice. And there's some history, and there's some other things that a traveling spouse might enjoy. All of those take place in and around the Dodge City, Kansas vicinity. Yeah, that Dodge City where the gunfights and the legendary Western characters from Wyatt Earp to Doc Holliday spent their free time, plus all of the great public land during, that's available to you in the walk-in hunting access program in Kansas. You can learn more by going to ksoutdoors.com. Find that area on the map. Get a quick look at all of the private and public land open to hunting at no charge. It's all in Dodge City, Kansas, and the vicinity. The Upper 
Patient Podcast is brought to you in part by ESPamerica.com. Electronic earplugs. I'm a believer. I wear them in the range and I wear them in the field, both. And you ought to think about doing the same thing. Can't thank you enough for listening. Can't thank Dale Rollins enough for giving us all those insights into Blue and Bob White Quail. I hope you learned something. I know I sure did. Maybe we can all band together and get him out here to show him some valley quail and some mountain quail hunting. If you like the Upland Nation podcast, do me a big favor. Rate it and review it, especially if you are an Apple podcast subscriber. But anywhere you get it, please review and rate us. It does help, and I would appreciate it. You want to talk? Anytime, it's the Upland Nation Facebook page or the Wing Shooting USA Facebook page. Thanks for your recent reviews, Old Pro Bird Hunter, Gamer Boy, 527, and Skips. I think I get it, Skips. The spelling is funny, but it, it's pretty good. All right, I'll leave you with this quote from Mabel Louise Robinson. She says, from the dog's point of view, his master is an elongated and abnormally cunning dog. I'll consider that a compliment. You probably will too. Thanks again for listening. I'm Scott Linden. I'll see you next in the field.